Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's good that the sun is out. It is 11.04. Now today, our speaker, Mike, works at TSA, and he's all about, when he's at work, getting people through security, getting them on time. To hand them off to me, who's been in the airline industry for 30 years, and we're all about it on time. So we were set, ready to go. This, we were going to be pushing back. And then our maintenance department back there said, we've got a problem. The internet went down. So we have a mechanical problem, but uh, obviously we're up and going. So those joining us online, welcome. We're sorry for the small delay. We'll charge this delay to maintenance and uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. All right, we have three announcements today, three and, but we have three announcements and one unannouncement. What's an unannouncement? It's an announcement that's not an announcement. So, do you know somebody who's always late, who never shows up on time? Are you that person? Well, tomorrow there's not a time change. Actually, the time change happens this uh, this evening, I think it. I think we go like two two forty, two fifty, two fifty nine, and then it magically the ferry comes back and makes it two o'clock again. I think that's what happens. Nobody's awake to see it. Nobody sees the ferry move the time clock back, but it goes back. But this is the good one. This is the one where if you oversleep, you're still okay. But if you're always that person that's late, don't tell yourself the time change, and you'll be on time tomorrow, guaranteed. So it it happens once a year. The bad fairy that jumps ahead on the clock where it goes from like two to three o'clock, just like that, that, that bad fairy I think shows up in March. So, but we won't talk about that fairy. Um, okay, now to the announcements. If everybody could take a, if you gotta look, turn around and look at your sound and audio visual people right now. If you get a chance, because you're gonna expect, you were thinking, we're gonna see some, uh, and I know they won't turn the cameras themselves on themselves, they're just, they're, they don't do that, but uh, for those online, uh, the reaction is the people back there are new on the scene. And um, because we, we're used to our very dedicated uh, persons, you know, we'll say well, Debbie, Chris, and, uh, and uh, uh, Mike, and uh, of course uh, Mark being back there, and, and the, uh, uh, Lenny being back there. Um, but a lot of our church family uh, and those that are active in the audiovisual department are off doing other things. So it's not that they're taking the day off, but they have other responsibilities. Pathfinders, uh, leadership meetings going on uh, right now. Uh, so they're there. Uh, Mike's not back there because he's up here today. Um, so we're grateful. I make this announcement because we're grateful for those that are, are serving in our church and, and serving in multiple capacities. The other thing to be grateful for is the people that are back there right now. New faces. Uh, and that where, where one goes absence, uh, God always provides a way for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, somebody to come up and, and take their place. So we're grateful for uh, Sam back there, John back there. And, and of course, we have Jen. Everybody's moving around because Jen's usually up here. But she's out supporting Mike, her husband. And that means Loy is here uh, as also, uh, and I uh, like the youth in here, or the uh, that we have uh, serving our church now, so we're grateful for that. And that's a great segue to, uh, uh, to others that uh, give and work to our church. Uh, and I'd like to make mention of uh, Amy Tapia, who's come here. She has dedicated those years of service to our, our uh, Adventurers Club, and uh, she is asked down because of her busy schedule with family, uh, with other responsibilities. Uh, that she has asked that she uh, be allowed to uh, not be the director of adventures anymore and uh, stepping down and taking a break and focusing on her other many responsibilities and just want to say thank you for, for what you've done to the Adventures Club and, uh, and for your, your service. Um, but then that segues into what we've been talking about, how somebody somebody always pops up and is, is there to step up and, and take the place. And into official church business, I'd like to recognize that person that stood forward, it's Kelly Koonsman, who's taken her years of service uh, working with our youth um, 
and bringing it now to the church to take over where, and to fill the big shoes that Amy has, has, uh, has left. Uh, so our, we're grateful for Kelly uh, wanting to take that responsibility on with her experience, uh, but it just can't happen. It needs your help. And so we're going to do our first reading today. The first reading is for Kelly Koonsman uh, to assume the position of director of the Brownsburg Adventures Club. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, say nay. Eyes, eyes have it. And so uh, uh, there'll be second reading hopefully next week. I think that's all I have. So, Lloyd, uh, if you could open up our service in song and praise. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Can I ask a question? <laughs> Do you trust God? I mean, obviously, right? But why? Why do you trust him? Well, we are always told to um, have faith and to trust God, right? But sometimes, in some situations, it's easier said than done. So. It's nice to remind ourselves the reasons why we trust him, the reasons, remind ourselves the reasons that he um, knows better than us, he knows what he's doing, that he um, is worthy of our trust, and that everything is possible when we trust him. Amen? So... As we sing our first song, I want you to remind yourselves of the reason why you trust God. Um, so let us sing together hymn number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his word. Saint the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, precious Jesus. All for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to tease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. Proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, 
all for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me till the end. Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for great to trust Him Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful that we're here in your house to worship you. Father, we turn our minds and our hearts to you, asking for your spirit to quicken our thoughts. Father, you bless us with so much, and we're here to honor and worship you, not just for an hour, but the whole entire day. Lord, we just pray for your angels to surround this church, the parking lot, and for those who are still on their way to protect them and to bring them to your house of worship. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so our next song reminds us that um, whenever life becomes difficult or um, overwhelming, we can always find assurance um, from the Lord by leaning on the everlasting arms. So um, let, uh, sing with me hymn number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's rise. What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, and secure from all alarms. everlasting arms Oh how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way leaning on the everlasting arms Oh how bright the path grows from day to day leaning on the everlasting arms Secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my. Everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all our arms Leaning, leaning On the everlasting arms
Folks, we can, we can be seated now. remember all that. Well, if it's going to have a Bible lesson, start, um, yeah, we'll go. I got a Bible verse that says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there ye also may be also. Do you know who that is? Do you know who's, who's, talk, who's saying that? Go ahead and just spit it out. You got it, dude. Okay. So our lesson today is about <clears throat> leaning on God and trusting in him. So, who knows Moses? Yeah, we all know Moses, right? Okay, so Moses, sounds like this is screaming. I've got such a voice, I almost don't need that thing. Hold that out here. Um, so Moses was uh, going, with, with God's help, was guiding the children of Israel out of, Is out of Israel to the land, the promised land in Canaan, okay, which was from Egypt to Canaan. And God directed them all the way there, okay? But when God got, or when, when Moses got there, guess what happened? He wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. We won't go into that today. Why? That's another story. So anyways, but he wasn't able to go in. So he had to tell his people that I am not going to be able to go into the promised land with you. And he was so sad. And all the people were so sad. And they're like, what are we going to do without Moses? I don't know. What are we going to do? Well, then Moses said, Joshua, come here. So Joshua went up there and he put his hand on Joshua. And he said, Joshua, you're going to finish leading the people into the promised land. And you are to teach them to worship our God, to worship God always, and keep him in your hearts always. And he go, okay. So then the people was like, okay, we got Joshua now. So then, um, what's next? Oh, <laughs> get my notes. <laughs> um, so then after they, they did that, um, uh, Moses was told by God to um, go up onto Mount Nebo. And when he got up to the top of Mount Nebo that day, God showed him as he was going up, God kept encouraging him all the way up because Moses was 120 years old by then. And climbing that big mountain, I know at 70, I don't think I can do it. But God encouraged him all the way up to the top of the mountain. And then he showed him the whole promised land, from the north to the south, from the east to the west, east to the west. Anyway, showed him all the land, so that at least he's seen it on, from on the top. And then, you know what happened? Something really sad. Moses died and was buried on the hill on that mountain. But then you know what happened? Something fantastic happened. God raised him up and took him where? Heaven, yes. And then Moses is there today. And so the moral of the story is we got to keep our hearts with Jesus, okay? And keep our eyes on him, kind of like Elijah did Elijah last week or last month. You know, we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will also be in heaven with Jesus, okay? So that's what we want to do. Does anybody want to pray? Let's close our eyes. Dear Jesus, I thank you for the little ones here today that finally came. 
and uh, pray that they will keep their eyes on you always, and that we all as adults keep our eyes on you always too, that we can also be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. There you go. It's time for our congregational prayer. Before we ready our hearts uh, with song, I um, want to point out, as we uh, normally do, that there are cards in front of you that if you have any special uh, prayer requests or praises that you would like to share or to be prayed for, um, either by just a pastor and the elders or if you check on the box that uh, you want the whole church to be praying for you. Uh, you can write those down and uh, bring them to me um, as we ready our hearts in song. <laughs> If you're able, I invite you to join me in prayer as we kneel before the Lord. In Matthew 3, it describes how John, I'm sorry, how Jesus approached John the Baptist. And as John was baptizing many in the Jordan, Jesus approached him, and, and John was confused, and he's like, Jesus, why are you here? I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, suffer to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all of our righteousness. In verses 16 and 17, read, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened up unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him in a low voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I bring this up because as a parent, as a brother or sister, as a co-worker, as a member of this church there are those that are around all of us that bear those titles, that need that encouragement. Jesus came down from heaven as a lowly human. He suffered countless temptations from Satan. And he now began his ministry that would lead to his death, crucifixion, and dying for our sins. How that must have been comforting to Jesus to hear from the Father that he was proud of his son. How many of us need to hear that? How many of those around us need to hear that message of encouragement that you're not alone, that we are proud of you, and we are here to help? Heavenly Father, we come before you Grateful as always that we have this freedom as a church to come in and praise you, to ask you to hear our prayers. And we know that you write it of a time where 
we won't have these freedoms. We can't so freely come to church. So we are grateful for today. We are grateful for the insight we have of what's coming forth so we can prepare us, ourselves and our children, our family. Father, we come before you with many burdens in our hearts, but we ask that you, that we take a moment, that we reflect upon where we've been, what messes we've made, what sins we've committed, and come before you and ask for your forgiveness. Father, we pray for those that, uh, of, that we know that our family that are, are struggling with, uh, with cancer right now. Uh, we pray for those that uh, are otherwise recovering uh, from, from COVID. Uh, we pray for our family members that are suffering with loss. Father, we ask that you look into our hearts. We raise up those names that we are praying for. We praise you for the gift of time and the gift of, of your word. We thank you for the anniversaries and the birthdays that we've celebrated. We're thankful for the time and the adventures, uh, the children, the responsibilities that you've given us. We give you thanks that you are our Father and that you are in our lives. Sometimes our hearts get so heavy we forget the other part, the realization of just how much you love us and how much you've done for us. Father, we lift up our hearts and we lift up our prayers to you. And we, Father, we want to be very clear that we need your help. But at the same time, as Jesus prayed, we pray that not our will, but your will be done. Your will that we know who loves us and loves our loved ones more than we could ever imagine. We pray that you help them in the way that is best for them, that is best towards their journey to your kingdom, that we may be there and be with our loved ones there with you someday. Father, I ask that you be with uh, Mike as he has prepared a message. He's had the Holy Spirit uh, present by his side as, as he looked for the words and the message that we need to hear today. We ask you to be with him. Allow Satan not to attack him and his family. Allow your words to be spoken today. And we pray all this, and we give praise all this through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The focus of our study today is found in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. May we feel solemnity and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit as we worship our God today. I think before I get started, I'll have just a little bit of water here. I remember the last time I got dry mouth. You can probably turn these microphones on this podium off. Lori, thank you for leading us in song service today. Scott, for having prayer. I just want to thank everybody in, involved. Sam running our sound back there. His friend Jonathan running our computer, making sure the stream goes out, and my wife switching the cameras for everybody there at home, Aquila, Mike, Glenda, so you guys can see everything that's going on up here. 
trial by fire. Because Thursday night, Jennifer and I stopped here and I showed her, trying to simplify things, what but buttons to push to make it very, very easy. It's not really running the cameras. Her position is, in the TV industry, is she's the technical director. Because as the cameras are up, she has them all numbered. She can see which one she wants to go to. She just pushes a button to go from either, this is considered uh, a wide shot, or we can go to medium shots, cameras one and three. But I want to thank everybody that's participated here. And also, once again, the call goes out. If there's anybody here who's interested in participating in the service, why not come forward and, and say something to one of us? Oh, but Brother Mike, I'm, I'm too timid. I'm too scared. So you doubt God. He's calling you to serve him in his church, to function as part of the church, to make everything run smoothly. Why not answer that call? Maybe your mindset is such that you don't think you have the talent. If the Lord calls, don't you think he'll fit you for that service? Yes, no, maybe so. I'm sorry, what? Okay, I'm hearing, I didn't hear anything at first. I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. For all the baptismal candidates that we've had in the last uh, month or so, and if I forget any, please don't be offended. It's not on purpose, but remembering... John Kunzman, his mother, Kathy Chanson, and we're praying for you for your recovery. Also, uh, Brother James Brinkley and Susanna Miskiman, I congratulate all of you for giving your life to God and rededicating your life to God. But as a Christian, I have to warn you that Satan is not going to redouble his attacks, but don't give in to that. I was here for John and Kathy's baptism. I was here for Susanna's baptism. But, Brother James, I wasn't here for your baptism because at that point in time, I was suffering from COVID. And not only did it wreak havoc on me, but it, it jumped to my wife. And as we uh, isolated in our apartment, I was terrified that my dad would get it, and he got it. And also my mom got it. But praise God. My dad didn't get it as bad as I had it. I think out of all of us, I had it the worst. A fever over 100, 100 was 101, Jennifer, for like a week, almost a week and a half. Couldn't seem to break it. But he didn't get the fever. He didn't get the nausea. Because he's on dialysis, and that's why I feared for him so greatly. I had worried about that. And then because of the port, they can test his blood. said, yep, you're positive, so we're going to have to send you down to downtown Indianapolis to Davida for your dialysis. And I was so weak, I couldn't even try to help my parents drive in there because I just couldn't do it. I mean, I'm the, I'm the oldest son. I'm supposed to be able to take care of mom and dad, and I couldn't do it. But then they tested his blood. After about a week, they said, well, you don't have anything. You're fine. You can come back to Brownsburg, which was a blessing because literally where we live in Brownsburg, the Vita is literally right around the corner. So that's easy for my mom. And people said, well, what were your symptoms? I said, I just remember waking up on a Sunday feeling bad as though I had a sinus infection like I've had before. So all the exact same symptoms were there. And then Tuesday morning I was going to go to immediate care, which I did because I, was, I seemed to not be getting better. And I have a CPAP. And as I was running my CPAP, I woke up one Tuesday morning early, ripped it off my face because my nose was hurting as though it was burning. And I go out into the living room and I ask my parents, what are you guys cooking? It smells like you're burning something. But at that point I had lost my smell. And I didn't know what was going on. I thought the CPAP had done something to me. I went to immediate care. No fever, no temperature, no cough. My lungs sounded clear. He gave me antibiotics saying, oh, yes, we see the fluid in your ear. And uh, yeah, it sounds like a sinus infection. But I got worse. I stopped eating because when you have no sense of smell, you have no taste. And anything you eat, it feels like you have marbles in your mouth. And marbles have no taste. You just feel lumps in your mouth. So when you stop eating, you lose weight. I lost about 12 pounds. And between the fever, between the hot and cold, between some of the body aches and the incessant coughing, I never said this out loud, but I'm thinking in my mind, Lord, just kill me, because I felt that bad. Especially because it just tore through our family. Then I start to think of my, well, what is my mindset? Because this sermon has rested upon in my heart for the last month or so, 
And I thought to myself, my mindset is terrible, Lord. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mindset are we talking about here? That's where we're going to get into this morning. But before we continue, let's go ahead and bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful. I am thankful that we're here in your house of worship. Before the doors open this morning, before Jennifer and I open up the church, your angels were waiting for us because your Sabbath had already begun. You were waiting on us to arrive and everyone else. Father, we know that your spirit is here. We know that your presence is here. We have prayed for your protection, and we believe that your angels are surrounding this church and our parking lot. Father, may the spirit move among us, convicting us, converting us, opening up our minds. I'm simply a messenger, Lord. I don't have the ability to do the convicting and converting. But we pray for the Spirit to move upon us. That even though we read the Bible, that today we'll see something different that we didn't see yesterday or last night. Father, have mercy on us. Forgive us of our sins through the blood of Christ. And quicken our minds and our thoughts. Again, we pray for the baptismal candidates who have given their lives to you and were baptized here. And for their decisions that you protect them and keep them safe. And for our church members who aren't here, those who are suffering from sickness, even COVID, that we pray that you'll comfort them. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. If you strive in all humility to understand what is the mind of Christ, you will not be left in darkness, Jesus says. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. From Youth Instructor, October 13th, 1892. Let this mind be in you. Are we going by our feelings or are we going by the intellect that God has given us? If we're going by our feelings, we're in a world of hurt. But we talk about let this mind be in you. Let's define what mind means. The mind is recollection, the memory, the element of complex elements, you know, that feels, perceives, thinks, wills, and especially reasons. Is this more expensive or is this more expensive? Is that, okay? Continuing on, our intention, our desire, our opinion, our viewpoint, our disposition, our mood. He's in a bad state of mind. Some of the synonyms for the mind is to hear, to hearken, to heed, to listen. That kind of makes more sense as we flesh that out a little bit. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. It says, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Hmm. First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 24, and we're talking about the mindset here, how Jesus reacted or didn't react. Let's turn to First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. I think we have it here on the screen. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Let's stop right there. Christ suffered. He suffered. So in our mindset, are we expecting not to suffer? He suffered, but there's some people who believe, well, I shouldn't have to suffer. Mm, Let's continue on here. Leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, and reviled means verbal abuse, somebody cursing at you, calling you a name, giving you the business. Does that make sense? But he reviled not again. It's human nature for somebody to get up in your face and start giving you the business that you want to give it right back to them. You don't even think about it. It comes naturally. But he reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not. And now on the internet, whether it be TikTok or whatever else, you see people getting on airplanes and not wanting to wear a mask or whatever else, and they're threatening people, both physically and verbally. He threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. 
who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. That we, being dead to sins, dead to sins, that means what we want to do, what we feel, what, how we want to go about our business, we have to push that aside and say, no, Lord, I don't live, but you live within me. Because even our reasoning, our human reasoning, always wants to supersede the will of God. But it comes natural to us. But yet we're asked, let this mind be in you. What mindset is it talking about? The mindset of Jesus. He came, and even though he was roughly handled, he didn't return in like manner, which means we have to have our minds renewed and recreated if we're going to follow his example. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. In other words, emulating Jesus. When we talk about a mindset, there is only two mindsets here on planet Earth. The first mindset is having the mind of God. Just like before sin, Adam, he named all the animals exactly what God would have named them. Why? Because they were in sync. The second mindset is the mindset of the devil. And or, I want to do it my way. Like Frank Sinatra, that song, and I did it my way. No, that's the way of the Satan. So there is only two mindsets. The question is for us, which mindset do you want? It can't be forced upon you, or can it? Ooh. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you and I don't want to do, don't want to have to go through. But again, who's running the program? You or God? What mindset do you have? Even Jesus said, take this cup from me, but... But, 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 not as I will, but as thou will. Jesus came not to serve himself, but to serve humanity. He humbled himself. Are we humbling ourselves? Are we? I don't know. John chapter 5, verse 30. The Bible says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Again, this mindset. Jesus was God, but he also was human. He set aside his divinity, his power to do miracles. The miracles that he did was the, the Father enabling them, because the apostles also did miracles. But did they have that power in themselves? No. So they had to have the same mindset that Jesus had as he worked with them those three and a half years because their mindset was different. They're looking for a temporal kingdom. They wanted to be right up next to Jesus. And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. I'd like to read a few things here from the Desire of Ages that I think is very important here today. Desire of Ages, page 330. We are to enter the school of Christ to learn from him meekness and lowliness. Meekness, meaning to be gentle. Now, for those of you who don't know, I work at the airport, and I celebrated my 15th year at the airport this past uh, August. And it's true, in those 15 years, I have seen and I have heard and I've experienced a lot. And to be meek it's very difficult when somebody is accusing you of something. It's very difficult when you're working with people where you're not seeing eye to eye and there's frictions among coworkers. That's very difficult. But the Bible records how Jesus, even his own, in his own household, there was friction. Even amongst the apostles, there was friction. And even though he would have been justified to lay down the law and let them know what's what, he didn't do that. Where we, as sinful human beings, when we know we're right, man, we want to just rail into somebody and let them know the business and, and how they're so wrong. So on one hand, 
we can be right, but also wrong. Meaning, we could be right that what has been happening to us or done to us, they shouldn't have done, but wrong in how we handle that. Because being meek and lowly and gentle, we're not going to respond as the world does. It means emancipation from ideas, habits, and practices that have been gained in the school of the prince of darkness. The soul must be delivered from all that is opposed to loyalty to God. We are repeating, when we go through the Bible in the Old Testament, everything that the Israelites went through, and then what the apostles were struggling with until they finally got it together. We're not really covering any new ground as we're retreading over the things that have already been done before. Because all of us can say we have our ideas, and we have our habits and our ways and our practices, but if they come contrary to the God, we have a decision to make. And he's not going to force that from you. You have to arrive at that on, on your own. Desire of Ages, page 431, the words of Christ pointing to his death have brought sadness and doubt. And the selection of the three disciples to accompany Jesus to the mountain had excited the jealousy of the nine. Have you been jealous? Has somebody been selected or promoted over you where you felt you should have gotten that, but somebody else did? Hmm. Instead of strengthening their faith by prayer and meditation on the words of Christ, they had been dwelling on their discouragements and personal grievances. When somebody wrongs you, it's like that's all you can ever think about. In this state of darkness, interesting that she would, Ellen White would, read, would write this, in this state of darkness, dwelling on their discouragements and their personal grievances, you're in a state of darkness. They had undertaken the conflict with Satan. In order to succeed in such a conflict, they must come to the work in a different spirit, a different mindset. Their faith must be strengthened by fervent prayer and fasting and humiliation of heart. Fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. What do you think that means? Hmm? Getting up in the morning and having breakfast. Dear Jesus, thank you for the food. Amen? Or something a little bit more with some substance, a little, a little bit longer than just that. And that prayer that you pray in the morning over your breakfast may not be enough to carry you through the late morning at work, let alone past lunchtime. Because it says fervent prayer and fasting and humiliation of heart. They must be emptied of self and be filled with the Spirit of God, I'm sorry, filled with the Spirit and power of God, earnest, persevering supplication to God in faith. Now, we hear these words, and like, yeah, that's okay, that sounds great, Brother Mike, but we don't put it into practice because persevering supplication, persevering, not giving up. Look at all these people who have given up their lives and dedicated their lives to become Olympians to try to win a chance to get on the Olympic team and then go to whatever country to participate. In 1988, when I was a student at Columbia Union College, now known as Washington Adventist University, the Olympics were going on, and I was reading a story about this one uh, female gymnast, Melissa Marlowe, and it was, was saying how she gave up from the age of six, essentially her childhood, practicing six days a week, with it six or seven hours a day, for a chance to win a spot on the U.S. Olympic team. And she did make it. But they, she was persevering and gave up what most high school kids come to enjoy, hanging out with their friends and doing this and that. She didn't do that because she was focused on trying to make the Olympic team. And then once you make it, it's like a once-in-a-lifetime shot, but then like everything else, it comes and then it goes. And as time goes by, we all get older. In 1988, all of us that were, some of us have, weren't born yet, but those who were, in 1988, you know what we all were at that time? Younger. Earnest, persevering supplication to God in faith. Faith that leads to entire dependence on God. Are we totally dependent on God or we just keep looking at our phones? Yeah, I got money in the bank. I'm good. Faith that leads to entire dependence upon God and unreserved consecration to his work can alone avail to bring men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle against principalities and powers the rulers of the darkness of this world and wicked spirits in high places. The 
mindset. Let this mind be in you. There is only two mindsets. From Desire of Ages, page 437, what they needed was a change of heart that would bring them into harmony with its principles, heaven's principles, God's principles. The simplicity, the self-forgetfulness, and the confiding love of a child are the attributes that heaven values. Except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, and I welcome everybody here, of all, and I've said this before, both in Sabbath school and the last time I was up front here. Out of all the places you could have been this morning, you chose Brownsburg. I thank God for that. Looking at camera number two, Jennifer, for those who are watching online, of all the places you could have been this morning, whether on your tablet, your computer, your phone, you chose to dial in here. I thank you for that. Praise God. Because of all the other choices we have available, you didn't have to be here. You could have easily have slept in. There are all kinds of different excuses, but yet you're here. And electronically, you're here. The sincere, contrite soul is precious in the sight of God. He places his own signet upon men, not by their rank, not by their wealth, not by their intellectual greatness, but by their oneness with Christ. The Lord of glory is satisfied with those who are meek and lowly of heart. Can your family members say that you're gentle and kind? Can your coworkers say that you're meek and kind? Can anybody say that about you? If, if not, or maybe sometimes, maybe we need to revisit that and rethink about that. Because it doesn't come naturally, but we have a source to go to to access this. Thou hast also given me, said David, thy shield of salvation and thy gentleness as an element in the human character hath made me great, from Psalms 18, verse 35. Something else here I want to I wanna read from Desire of Ages that I think is very, very important. I even have it underlined here, but we'll go with the first paragraph. It says, even in this life, it is not for our good to depart from the will of our Father in heaven. And I'm sure every one of us can say that we've departed from God in one way or another, even myself, and the question is, how'd that work out for you? Seriously, how'd that work out for you? Okay, maybe not so okay? For me, it was disastrous. When we learn the power of his word, we shall not follow the suggestions of Satan in order to obtain food or to save our lives. Our only questions will be, what is God's command and what is his promise? Knowing that these, we shall obey the one and trust the other. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Think about that. Get on your phone, you can't access your bank. You go to the bank in person and say, I'm sorry, there's a hole in your account. Why? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. A lot of us do our bankings on our phone, and if we can't access our bank from our phone, we're, we're, we're out there. So you drive up to the bank and go to the ATM, put your card in. It's rejected. So the funds are unavailable. What do you do then? You write a check. For those of us who still have checks and you still do it the old-fashioned way, comes back insufficient funds. But, but, but the last time I checked, everything was there. Uh, no. Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will finally be decreed that they shall be put to death. And from there you can see Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. I underlined this in the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan. Those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off, which means you're not going to be able to depend on your pastor. Pastor, if you're watching, no, no offense. You're not going to be able to depend on the church, the conference, the president of, of the Adventists, maybe your own folks, your parents, your wife, your husband. It's going to be you all by yourself. And I underline this because right now, this nation is facing a COVID-19 mandate. If you are not vaccinated for federal workers by this month, the 22nd, they want to get rid of you. There are many lawsuits going on right now where right now some agencies have halted that or suspended that. The president even said, well, we're going to wait till January 4th of uh, 2022. But the interesting thing that I bring up about that, because see, I recovered from COVID. 
My question is, when I put in the medical exemption, why should I get that if I recover from it? I was not hospitalized. I had no complications. Well, there's no answers. They have no guidance on that. But they keep pushing the mandate at TSA. And the thing is, people are saying, oh, Brother Mike, you're, you're, you're dividing the church. No, I'm simply pointing out what we see every day on the news. Because this mandate, if you don't go with it, you're not going to have a job. Some people in other fields, firefighters, police officers, some of the hospitals in this state of Indiana and elsewhere have already quit or they've already been terminated. They've made a choice. Their mindset was, I don't want to put this into my body. And I also filled out a religious accommodation, and I still haven't heard yet back what they're going to do with us. We're in the holding pattern. But the thing is, though, earthly support, how you make a living, that's pretty big, right? If you have a mortgage, if you have a car payment, if you have a school payment, you kind of need that, right? Some people say getting the vaccine is the mark of the beast. No, it's not. But you know the interesting thing about it? Is the force behind it. We haven't seen something like that here in the United States in quite a long time. At least in my lifetime, I don't remember being forced to do something. Now, on the medical side, when I've gone to my doctor for my diabetes, he's prescribed medications for me that when I looked into the side effects, because they did have a sheet providing all the possible side effects, and when I looked at that, I said, whoa, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, hang on, doc. Uh, uh, no, because right now, I'm not currently experiencing any of these side effects that this new medicine, uh, a combination of two medicines, so I only have to take one pill, now it's going to give me these issues, like a urinary tract infection, is it? I've never had that. Why do I want to take something with that possibility? And he said, okay. He didn't fire me as a patient. He didn't say, I'm going to have to call your employer and have some, something, something done with you. That never happened. But see, with this, the government providing medication, where is the freedom of choice simply to say, I, I appreciate what you're doing, but I, I don't want it? Nowhere in the Bible Nowhere in the Bible will you find that God has forced anything on anybody. He has left that mindset with you to make your choice based on the information you have available to you or the ability to go find the information. Amen? Nowhere has he forced anybody to take anything, to eat anything, to work anywhere, to do anything unless they decided to do it. And the only thing I'm saying when I talk to people about this is it's interesting because as we get to Revelation and we talk about the mark of the beast where people are forced to worship on the day, why aren't more people upset about this mandate? Because the element of force is there. The template is now there. Five years ago, people would read the Bible and say, I can't understand how something like this could happen as far as forcing people to worship on a day when we have laws. Yeah, we do have laws. How's that working out for some of us? Hmm. I, it's right there in front of your face. People can get on their phone, on their tablet, on their computer. You can look this up for yourself and decide what you will do. I'm not telling you what to do in any, in any direction. That's left with you. That's how God operates. Here's the information. What make you of it? Come now, let us reason together. Choose you this day whom you will serve. It doesn't say, you will serve me. It doesn't say that. It says, choose you this day whom you will serve. From Joshua chapter 14, verse 15, I believe. Is it 24? Yes. 24, 15, thank you. Nowhere are we forced to do anything. But at the same time, our choices, whatever we make for God or against God, have consequences, amen? Something's going to happen one way or the other. Same with these mandates. People have to make a choice, and there's going to be a con consequence one way or the other. Now, the interesting thing is at the airport, I've heard somebody said who's fully vaccinated because now they're talking about booster shots. So is that going to happen like every four months? If you don't get the booster, then you're out the door? And then one guy said, well, what was the point of me even getting the first two then if we're going to have all these boosters? It's something that you have to personally decide for yourself. But all I'm saying is the template of coercion and force We've heard this before, but could never make the correlation. Well, how could this happen? We're seeing it happen now. Why? Because it's a pandemic, and they declared a national emergency. When the government declares a national emergency, our Bill of Rights, our rights as citizens that we've come to enjoy, they get to kind of push it off the table a little bit because we have to handle this emergency. Remember two weeks 
two weeks, everybody stayed home so we can flatten the curve. And the two weeks became two months, and then four months and six months. Do, do you see how, how this progression? But again, the template of force, coercion. The president himself said, we've been very patient, but our patience is wearing thin. That, that's a threat. Has God ever threatened anybody? No, he hasn't. Those who are lost are lost because they've chosen their way, listening to Satan. God didn't desire that. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 16. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. If you're without a job, the Lord's not going to let you die of thirst and he's not going to let you starve. You may come right up to the the very moment where there absolutely is no money in the bank account or you can't access your account, he's, oh, get this. You find out you can't access your account because they consider you a terrorist. Words and names mean something. The mindset of Black Lives Matter, the, 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 the mindset of Antifa, the mindset of protesters, the mindset of all those parents in Virginia that we're against the critical race theory. All this resonates with us, and it's a mindset develops. But the question is, what mindset do you have? Is it the mindset of Jesus, or is it the mindset of the devil where we simply react? Because we all know how that goes when we react. Somebody does something to us, you're driving down the road, and somebody doesn't put their signal on, or they cut you off. You react, blowing your horn, and you start saying words in your car, don't you? Maybe some hand gestures go. I don't know, but that's what comes naturally. But to be meek and lonely, we don't react like that. But now, as we get closer and closer to Jesus' is coming, brothers and sisters, I believe we're right on the very threshold. I believe, personally, and again, take this for what it's worth, look it up for yourself, that we are in a little time of trouble. Because this is something that is not only affecting everybody here in the United States, but across the globe with these mandates that if you don't get the jab, you have no job. We just read in Isaiah 33, 16, he shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks, bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. He's promised to take care of us. We read in the Old Testament when Israel was marching through the desert, did he not feed them? Did he not give them water? This is the part where you can respond yay or nay. Okay. If he provided for their well-being then, we have the promise right here he's going to do the same for us now. But again, the one thing about this mandate that I find very, very interesting is people are being brought to a point of decision. You have to decide what you're going to do. You have to decide. There is no sitting back on the table, well, it'll blow over in a few months. I mean, this thing will go away. I don't think it's going to. Because when you read Matthew chapter... Um, Chapter 24, looking at verses 1 through 13, hearing wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not, not yet. I mean, the Bible talks about things getting worse. Now, people are saying, oh, Brother Mike, I came here to be blessed. Don't scare me. No, if you're scared, then maybe you're not really praying enough. If you're scared, maybe you're not really in the word enough to see how he will lead you. Because look at Jesus' life. He suffered. We just rest. He suffered. He suffered in his own family. He suffered with the apostles where they didn't understand. And then those priests and rabbis, the Pharisees and Sadducees, when they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath, it was interesting because he didn't break the Sabbath. But on the Sabbath day, when they accused him of that, they were plotting his own death. Because their mindset was darkened by the power of Satan. Psalm 37, verse 19, they should not be ashamed in the evil time. And brothers and sisters, it is bad out there. For all you families here that have young children, monitor their internet usage or just cut it off. The TikToks, the YouTubes, because if you're not paying attention to what they have access to, they can get access to a lot of bad stuff. They're too young. They don't need this stuff in their heads. You're the parent, even though some states, some local governments or say, no, we will decide what we teach your children. They're trying to replace you. Don't let that happen. Because it's already happening before our very eyes, and some people are just sitting there, yeah, small glitch, it'll get better. Get better? What are you talking about? It's not like it was five years ago. Walmart is not open 24 hours anymore. They close at 11. Myers and Kroger's are not open 24 hours anymore. They close at 11. I think Myers at 12. Never would have ever thought that would have happened. 
And, and the Speedway gas stations here in town, they close at 10. And not only do they close, they lock their pumps and turn them off. If you need gas too bad, you better find another gas station. Not going to happen there. Do we really believe all this? Hmm? Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And endure means to remain firm under suffering or misfortune without yielding. These mandates are putting, putting the screws to a lot of people. After the 22nd of this month, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I, I just don't. There are people speculating, but most of the people that have gotten the shot, they figure they're secure. One person who uh, got one of the shots has told me, I'm, I'm having heart issues now. I'm going to see a heart specialist because I didn't have this before. Now I'm, I'm having complications. This is all information you need to know about to make an informed decision. Because with these shots, I don't like to call them vaccines because when you say vaccine, people automatically think, I'm inoculated, I'm good, I'm protected, right? That's what they were telling us eight months ago when President Trump was still the president. We're going to get these shots out to you so you can be protected from getting then all of a sudden, when President Biden became president, it morphed into, well, it'll help minimize, if you do get it, it won't be as bad. Just like the flu shots. They used to say the same thing, and I've never had a flu shot in my life. And then now my question, I asked management, I said, I've recovered from it. I have all kind of antibodies now. Why do I need this? And they can't give me an answer. And when I looked up vaccines, the term that they were using is when they create vaccines, they're trying to train the body to see these diseases. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, who did our immune system? God did, right? So they're saying, man is saying, I'm so, we're so smart, we're going to develop something to enhance your immune system. So are we, are we saying we're now above God and God didn't do it right? Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let, him, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created him, male and female. Jennifer, do me a favor. Go to camera number two. Would you come up here, please? I didn't tell her I was going to do this earlier because she'd be nervous because she's always nervous when she has to come up front. That's Okay. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female. Thank you, you can sit down. Now, I'm not, I didn't demonstrate that just to be a wise guy or a smart aleck. Like, there's a reason. I'm going to show it here just shortly. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. The combination I just showed you is the only way he, the human race can multiply. There is no other. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. This is important because the mindset that's out there now, and this comes from Newsmax.com, referencing the Washington Free Beacon reports that in 2016, New York State recognizes 31 genders. That's, that's not a, uh, a misprint. 31 genders it recognizes, and the list is a guide for businesses which can be fined as much as $250,000 if establishments refuse to address someone by their preferred pronoun. So the mindset is, do you believe what we just read in Genesis? He created man in his image, male, and as Jennifer was up here, female. There are no other genders. So the mindset for you is, what do you believe? Because to believe other than this, you're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be made fun of. You may even have somebody threaten your life. Look at all these senators. It doesn't matter what the party is, Republican, Democrat, that aren't going by some of these protesters' way, and they're up in their car yelling and screaming and cursing at them. It's, so, it's as though their mindset has been replaced by that of devils. They have no reasoning ability anymore. They're simply reacting by emotion. Is that what we want, or do we want the mindset of Jesus? I put Genesis in there, and I put this information on here that 
In 2016, this New York State recognizes 31 genders because if that's the case, if that's what people are pushing, it makes reading the Bible now almost difficult. People aren't going to understand it. Does that make sense? This is why it's vitally important as parents, and I see some parents here today, you need to be more involved in what your kids are learning. Because if they get this stuff pushed in school, they're not going to understand the Bible. It's going to be confusing, and when things are confusing, our habit, our natural inclination is to push it away and say, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do this over here. I'm going to read about Harry Potter. That's what's waiting for them, and that's what's waiting for us as adults. I read this a few months ago when I was up here back in February of this year. It's called A Trip into the Supernatural by Roger J. Morneau, copyright 1982, and was updated in 1983. And on page 43, under the chapter Worship Room of the Gods, the spirits, we're talking about the demonic spirits, would encourage people to listen to their feelings instead of the word of Christ and his prophets. That's vitally important because people do things now because well, I've always felt this way. I've always felt different, and I'm expressing my true self. In no sure way could the spirits obtain control of people's lives without the individuals realizing what was happening. The spirits would suggest all kinds of erroneous doctrines and ideas, and humanity would readily accept them because they felt strongly about them. Last week, Brother Joel had, was talking about but Christ and talking about sports and how passionate people are about sports. No different than if you believe in something so passionately, but yet it's not backed up biblically. Also, on page 61, under the chapter Spirits and Actions, listen to this. And this was a man who now sleeps in Jesus, but wrote this book because when he became an Adventist, throughout his life, he started a prayer ministry for people. And he had incredible answers to his prayers. In fact, he has a book called Incredible Answers to Prayer, and when you need more incredible answers to prayer, I'm sure through the ABC you can probably still get this. Get, he had several books out, and there were, it's unbelievable the things that happened to him and other people that he prayed for. But before he became an Adventist, he got involved in spiritism, you know, worshiping Satan. He was just on the very verge of, you know, almost going all in, and there was that controversy, and he documents this. But from the chapter Spirits in Action on page 61, the fact that Adventists celebrate the biblical Sabbath of creation makes it impossible for the spirits to deceive them. The creator gives them special help and great spiritual insights, so in that sense, they are not ordinary people. Because we're worshiping God here today. But that doesn't mean we can rest on that, because we still have to depend on him, because there's so much going on out there that we have to decide on. There's no more sitting back, there's no more... I'm just going to work five days a week. Okay, the weekend's here. Yeah, I come to church because it's my habit thing. I show up for church. Hey, God, look, I'm here. I'm good, right, right, right? You're going to save me? It's more than that. For all of you people here who are married, if you spent 15 minutes a day, if that, with your, with your spouse, is that enough? Or let's say you went two or three days and didn't even see him, didn't even bother to talk with him, and then when you did come home from work, as my wife does, she wants to talk, and I'm like, hey, I've been talking to people for eight hours. I mean, I, I, need, I need some downtime. Okay, she understands that, but beyond that, we need to have some interaction. When there's no interaction, is there a relationship? Is there? Then it's the same thing here. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And there's so many people now that are just thinking, hey, things are going to get better. Brothers and sisters, with everything that's happening, isn't there enough going on that we should now be awake and, and start studying and realize, hey, this really hasn't happened before, and hey, we haven't had our government actually force things on us. We, maybe, maybe we're closer than, than we think. We are. It's like every day that goes by, you always read in the news, there's some video clip of somebody having an altercation on an airplane. Now, TSA, in the month of September, within the span of 25 days, I found two loaded guns in a bag. And the number one excuse that they always give us is, oh, I forgot. Now, how do you forget that you have a loaded Glock in your bag with a clip? How is that even possible? But this is what they tell us. We're there to find stuff like this, because if you're going to be flying in the next couple days where you did fly, 
how would you feel? 35,000 feet up in the air, and the guy brings down his book bag and opens it up, and, and, and his gun falls out. Are you okay with that? Because the first thing you're thinking is, oh, oh, my, oh, my Lord, help us. And then why didn't TSA get this? Because that, that's what we do. We look for this. Guns and knives and, and explosive devices. That's, that's why we're there, or else why would we be there? But in the space of 25 days, I found two weapons in a bag. A little disconcerting. Acts of the Apostles, page 260, paragraph 1. There are in the world today many who close their eyes to the evidences that Christ has given to warn men of his coming. They seek to quiet all apprehension, while at the same time the signs of the end are rapidly fulfilling. And the world is hastening to the time when the Son of Man shall be revealed in the clouds of heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is the second time in the United States' history we have a Catholic president. And if memory serves, if I'm cr incorrect, correct me on that, I don't, that's okay. Out of the nine justices of the Supreme Court, our highest court in the land, seven of them are Catholic. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. And the Pope, I think Biden is over there or is on his way back from meeting with the Pope. That should ring a bell with people. We should be looking at this saying, these are simply warning signs. Because let's look at it this way. We all know the mark of the beast is Sunday observance, which they're going to mandate. But how we get from there to here, I'm sure other things are going to happen. Because we as human beings, when things happen, we react emotionally. Rather than stop back and just take a second there and say, okay, let me logically critically analyze what's going on here rather than react. Because look at how Jesus was handled. He didn't react right away. He groaned in himself and said, because his disciples, the people, didn't understand his mission. What's our mission? To warn people what's going on. And to diligently seek for truth. Paul teaches that it is sinful to be indifferent to the signs which are to precede, precede the second coming of Christ. Those guilty of this neglect he calls children of the night and of darkness. Are we of darkness? Are we children of the night? Or are we children of the light? Those guilty of this neglect he calls children of the night. He encourages the vigilant and watchful with these words, but ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We're almost at the end. Evangelism, page 218, paragraph 5. We have no time to lose. The powers of darkness are working with intense energy, with the stealthy tread. Satan is advancing to take those who are now asleep as a wolf taking his prey. We have warnings now which we may give, a work now which we may do, but soon it will be more difficult than we imagine. Yeah, it's going to get a lot more difficult if you don't have a job. Gas prices are going up. I remember when they hit almost $4 here back in 2005, 2006, when George W. was president. And we had a, Jennifer and I, we had smaller cars then, four-cylinder, but we had a thing where when it hit half a tank, we would fill up again because as, as gas gets more expensive, it, even at half a tank, it's crazy. And then we would combine all of our, our shopping journeys so they didn't, we'd have multiple stops because gas was too, too expensive. And now it's getting back up there again, which affects everything else. For those back in 2005, 2006, do you remember the gas surcharge tax that different companies would, would hit you with? That could easily come back. Right now, at the airlines, at the airport, it's busy, busy, busy. We have folks as young as three and as old as 95 flying. Busy, busy, busy. Mm -hmm. But that could easily change in a heartbeat, just like when COVID first dropped on the United States and it just shut everything down. First, first Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Now, over the years, when I've heard people quote this scripture, I used to think to myself, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Well, that's not practical, Brother Mike, 
because I have to work. I, I'm, I'm in a store. I, and there's endless amount of excuses. Pray without ceasing. It is possible, and you can do it. Now, people text without ceasing, it seems, or they're on their, they're binge-watching stuff on Netflix without ceasing, but this is more than that. Pray without ceasing at the airport. And I don't even know when I started to realize this, but when I would go and use the restroom, before it was always quiet, even though they had speakers in there. Now they're playing music. And it's not the kind of music that's uplifting, and it's not the music that's worshiping and praising God. And haven't you had it happen to yourself that somebody s- talks about a song or they sing something, then you have that stuck in your head the rest of the day? Haven't you had that happen? Had that happen to me a lot. And of all the times that we don't need this t- type of garbage in our head, it's now. So now, this whole past week when I would go in there, I used to dread it because it's like, Lord, you have to help me. I said, I don't want this music running around in my thoughts. I don't want the lyrics. I don't want the rhythms. I don't want the backbeats permeating my thoughts, but I have no strength to resist, but you, Lord, can help me. So the whole time I'm in the restroom, and I don't have to go into any more detail that you, we're all adults here, and for the children here, moms and dads, you can explain it to the kids. But when you're in there, when I was in there, I'm praying this nonstop. Even when they would have advertisements, commercials, I'd say, Lord, help push this out of my thoughts. And then after I was done, I'd walk out, I wouldn't remember anything that I heard. It is possible, but the question is, do you believe it? This is why it says pray without ceasing. When you go to Walmart, when you go to Kroger's, they have music playing. Now, you may not like the music. In fact, if you're with your wife or husband or you're with the kids, you may be talking, not even aware of it, but it's still playing and it's accessing your thoughts. You need to be aware of this, and we need to do something about this, because if we don't and, and get all laid back and say, well, it doesn't matter, does it? If it doesn't, why are they playing it? If, you, if you're there to shop and buy things, you have your list or you have your phone and you're focused, why would they be playing it? It serves no purpose. Some people say, well, it helped create a calming shopping experience. Well, okay, I guess. But pray without ceasing. It does work, and we need to access that more. In fact, this past week, I had to replace something on Jennifer's car, her windshield cowl. I ordered the part. I measured everything. As I'm putting it on there, wouldn't you know, I mean, this little bugger wouldn't go on there. I'm checking the clips, I'm rearranging things, and said, and I'm getting frustrated. My mom was there to help earlier, and then she had left, and she told me later she was praying for me, and I'm getting so angry. And brothers and sisters, when you get angry, the natural tendency is to curse. Let's be honest. Let's not, let's not beat around the bush. That's what comes to your mind. And as I'm trying not to force this thing, because I, sp- I spent a lot of money on this, so I don't want to break it. But at the same time, it's not, it's not going in there. This is not good. Muy malo, not good, no bueno. And I'm trying to get this cow because you have to tilt it down and there's a narrow channel to get up underneath the clip so the windshield goes right like that and it wouldn't fit and it wouldn't fit. And I finally, out of exasperation, I'm out in the parking lot at our apartment complex and said, Lord, please help me because I'm, si- I'm so angry. I just, I just want to curse, but I don't want to, but you have to help me. And after I prayed that, I lined up and snapped in. I said, praise God. I didn't expect it to happen that quick, but why not? It happened. And I had spent at least 20 minutes fooling with this thing, and nothing was working. I'm checking everything, and it just snapped in. I was able to bolt everything down. Pray without ceasing. It's not an afterthought. It's It's not something that we can eventually attain to. It's something real we can use right now today. So again, in closing, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in, in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Are we living in this life on this planet looking for people to serve us, or are we willing to serve? At your job, Are you willing to do your best even though they don't recognize your hard work and don't compliment you or or acknowledge that, yes, we don't have to tell you things. You're already on top of it. You know what needs to be done. You're always there to fill that gap. Even if you don't get recognized, will you still be a servant and do it anyway? And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Will you be humble or do you want that recognition? 
or do you want that paycheck? And became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Obedient. They make me wear a face shield when I'm at the airport because I'm unvaccinated. And what my personal thoughts on that is irrelevant, but the thing is, though, I am doing everything they've asked me to do. Whether I agree with it or not is not the issue. If Jesus was obedient, I'm going to be obedient too by his grace. All the forms I had to fill out twice, I jumped through all their hoops, and now I'm leaving it in his hands. What happens is what happens. There's a very strong possibility, even if they allow us to stay through the holidays, which conveniently, they're going to need us. But even after the holidays, if they decide to fire me, well, then so be it, because I've made a decision based on all the evidence that I've read. And if my body's the temple of God, I need to keep it under subjection to God. I made a decision back in June after our anniversary. I said, Lord, I have a problem with caffeine. The problem is I can't seem to stay away from it. I've had doctors over the years tell me, Brother Mike, you're a diabetic. Caffeine's not good for you. Really? Why? Why? And they would never have an answer for me. So I went and did some research and found on secretsunsealed.org, Dr. Milton Tesk has a video on DVD, CD, that you can watch. And again, the quality is not 100% because it was shot 11 years ago. And our technology and our computers and our screens have advanced. So you actually have to, for those who have computers, we can down-res the resolution on your computer to make it a little bit more clear. But all the important information is there and you can see it. And a long story short, he answered all my questions of what caffeine does. Not only does it not give you energy, and people are like, how, how can that be? Because when I drink it, right away I'm ready to go. Think of it this way. What it does to you is it forces your cells to give everything and then some that it doesn't have. Think of a horse race. The jockeys, the crop, they're beating that horse, beating it, beating it, trying to wring out every last ounce of energy to make that horse go faster and further so it can win. The caffeine in our cells blocks the receptors. It's like taking a key into a keyhole. It fits, but it won't turn. So when the cell wants to shut down and rest, it can't because the caffeine has blocked that. Conversely, when the cell needs to come up and alive and start functioning, it can't because the caffeine has blocked that. I found out that it interrupts your sleep cycle. It interrupts the body's ability to repair and heal itself. In February of this year, one c for those who aren't, that's the blood Blood sugar reading over a three-month period it shows you where you are. Normal, you people should be between 5.7 and 6, somewhere, somewhere in there. Mine was 9.8. In June of this year, it dropped down to 9.3. So in the space of four months, it only dropped a couple points. When I stopped consuming caffeine, that means chocolate. I know some people are about ready to faint because one Hershey kiss has one milligram of caffeine. and It's not the amount of caffeine it's simply what the caffeine does to you. So that means no more chocolate. That means no more coffee, whether hot and cold. That means no more Starbucks. That means no more cola sodas. From right after my birthday, mid-June, I'm sorry, right after our anniversary, mid-June to the day before my birthday, it went from 9.3 to 7.9. That's a huge jump. And the only thing I did differently, the only thing, because I wasn't exercising, wasn't walking, is I stopped drinking caffeine. That was the only change. And how can we have the mind of Jesus if the caffeine constantly has this buzzing? You can't hear the still small voice when you're just constantly buzzing, and then when you come off that, that, that fever pitch, then you, you're just you're, you're brain fog, you're tired, you just don't want to be bothered. You can't focus. When we need to have the mind thinking and focusing. So the question is, which mind is in you? We all have choices and decisions to make, brothers and sisters. It's not going to get easy, but we already have read the promises where Jesus, his Father, will make sure our bread and water is secure, that we, he's not going to let us starve. I pray that we all have the mind of Jesus, because if we don't, then we're not going to make it. Brothers and sisters, I, I thank you for your attention. That's the end of the sermon. That's it. There's, there's no more. But the signs are all out there. And I know over the years when I've, I would hear sermons like this, I, mean, I would get all tense and anxious and
concerned and worried, but that's because I wasn't reading and studying. When we talk about a relationship with God, look at the people you're sitting next to. They're your family or friends. You have a relationship, which means you talk to them every day. You're interacting with them every day. Why should it be any different with God? We can pray on our knees. We can pray in a restroom. We can pray putting stuff on our car. We can pray anywhere at any time. We don't have to be kneeling. We can be in our car and just talking out loud verbally to God. We could be thinking in our thoughts because do we want God's thoughts or do we want Satan's thoughts? The choice is ours. But that's my prayer. Let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. Let's stand as we have our closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful that we have the opportunity for how much longer? No one knows. Your Spirit has quickened our mind and our thoughts to show us what is happening around us and the template leading up to Sunday observance. The devil's hand has been tipped. He always forces, coerces. You do not. You always give us a choice. Father, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins and we ask for the power of your spirit to recreate us from the inside out that our thoughts will now become your thoughts and your ways become our ways. Quicken us from the inside out, Lord. Help us to truly trust you and to pray without ceasing so our mindset will be the mindset of Jesus. He came, Father, and did your will here on earth. He didn't come to serve himself or do his own thing. He gave us the template. He gave us the example. We ask for the power of your spirit to make this a reality. Lord, help increase our faith. The spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. But Lord, help us, because we are on a threshold. Things are happening faster and faster. There's so much agitation, worry, concern, inflation, gas prices, job uncertainty. We know eventually where all this leads, Lord. Help us to see these signs and put them in perspective and to study even more and to be ready. Lord, I ask for a special blessing on those mentioned earlier this morning, the baptismal candidates who have baptized and given their lives to you and also for this congregation here, for the men, for the women, for the boys, the girls, the moms and the dads. Bless them, Lord. May they leave your sanctuary making the decision to not wait till later, but today, now. Thank you, Father, for hearing our humble prayer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Please rise as we sing our closing hymn, Take the Name of Jesus with You. Hymn number 474, Take the Name of Jesus with You. When 
Brothers and sisters, before we there, I would be remiss, excuse me for one moment. I would be remiss to acknowledge the fact that when I filled out my religious accommodation at the airport, the pastor had supplied me a template, uh, uh, a letter from the conference for the conscientious objection of not receiving the shot. I just wanted to make mention of that because the pastor helped me in that. But when I filled out the form, I was just impressed, rather than copying and making copies that I could attach to it, I just filled out the form they presented so they could re read it down because it's either going to be one person or a panel of three, five, or seven people determining whether or not they're going to accept and grant the accommodation. But the pastor was very helpful in that in helping me assemble my thoughts and answer their questions because they only had six questions. And they said, is there anything else further that you would like to submit? And I figured, well, I'm just going to give you, fill out the boxes that they gave me because it just seemed prudent to do so rather than just have them go through paper after paper after paper and then let God work in doing according to his pleasure. But let's go ahead and bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, the service here in your house is over, but the Sabbath is still yet. We just pray for your continued presence as we leave your house of worship, quickening our minds and our thoughts to help us see the signs that are about us, and desiring that mindset of Jesus and before we leave your house today to decide yes Lord work within me let your spirit recreate me because I want this mind to be in me the mind of Jesus I want to be obedient I want to be a servant and I want to do your will not my will help us to be dead father dead to ourselves that you live in us and animate us that we speak the words of kindness and we're gentle and meek Father, again, we pray for those who are sick, who are recovering from surgeries, that you be with them and help heal them and prepare them and prepare us who are soon about to break here in the United States as well as the whole world. Thank you, Father, for loving us and for promising us that our bread and our water would be sure and that you'll protect us in the munition of rocks, that you won't let us die by the wayside. All this we are thankful and grateful for. In Christ's name, amen. You seated? Jonathan, you can go ahead and uh, hit the fee there. We'll close that. And folks, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss you from the first row all the way back. And I hope you have a happy Sabbath and hope to see everybody back here next Sabbath.